Hello, everyone. This is Jason Harris with the National Health Council. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, we're going to get going in just a little bit just to give folks a little bit more time to join, but um, everyone's line will be muted to start. And so if you have any questions or comments, please do use the chat feature that we have um, available. And uh, again, we'll get started in just about uh, a couple minutes just to letting people join um, as 3 o'clock turns the hour. Okay. Hello, everyone. Again, this is Jason Harris with the National Health Council. Um, I think in the interest of time, we can, we can start to get going. Um, just a couple of ground rules as we get going. Uh, everyone's line will be muted, and um, so if you have any questions or comments, please, you, please do utilize the chat feature. Um, we'll answer questions and have a 15-minute Q&A, um, hopefully about 15 minutes left for that. And so with that, I'm going to kick it off to Eleanor Perfetto. Uh, the National Health Council's Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives, and she's going to walk us through today's webinar. Eleanor? Thank you, Jason. Um, just, just to be sure that everyone can hear me okay, if you are not able to hear me or if it sounds like there's anything wrong with the sound, just please send us a chat note letting us know what's going on and that there are any problems. Um, I want to welcome you all to the first in our uh, series of three webinars on patient engagement and value assessment. We're very excited to be putting this program on, and we want to recognize that um, Amgen is a, has been a sponsor to help us get this program available to you. So um, I, as I said, there are three webinars that are part of this series. Today is part one, and it's going to be an overview of value frameworks. Part two is going to be an introduction to health economics and value assessment, which is going to happen on October 25th. And part three is how the patient community can and should be engaged in the process. So let me just go back, let me, let me just go over what these three are going to be about. Today we're giving you an overview. So it's just going to be a little bit high level. It's going to be an introduction to what's going on in the environment. When we get to part two, we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to dig down a little bit more and talk a little bit more about health economic terms and definitions. Um, it, it may seem like it's something that uh, might be too much detail for you, but we really think it's important that the patient community has a very good sense of what many of these terms mean. So like, for example, when someone introduces the term of a quality, a quality is a quality adjusted life year. Um, we think that that's something that you really need to know basic, a basic understanding of, what that's about, because so many of these value framework and value assessment organizations are using the quality for the work that they're doing. So we'll go over things like that. And then part three, we'll get to how the patient community can and should be engaged and talk about some things that you can do and some tools that you can use to help you get prepared to engage and then to actually get in there engaged. So we're very excited about this three-part series. Um, and we um, hope that you will get quite a lot out of it. And we're going to begin today with the overview of value framework. So uh, what we'll be covering as part of today's discussion is a review of the current healthcare environment and the role of value. Essentially, we're going to get to why are we even talking about value, what's going on that's making this happen. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly are value frameworks and assessments. Um, what are these things that we're talking about? We're going to give an overview of key U.S. value frameworks that have been talked about, especially um, some of the ones that you might be the most familiar with, but also some new one, a new one that's coming on the scene, just so that you have an idea of what the lay of the land looks like. And then we're going to talk about what patients and advocates should be looking for. And we're going to end with a few case examples, um, and we have a couple of guest speakers who are going to be joining us to talk through some of these case examples and give you some of their real-life experience in working on value frameworks and value assessments. 
So let's talk a little bit about the current healthcare environment and the role of value. Um, increasingly, the healthcare, uh, healthcare system is working towards paying for value as opposed to paying for volume. So let me explain what I mean by that. In the past, with a typical fee-for-service arrangement, the way that bills typically got paid for in healthcare, um, providers, doctors, hospitals, et cetera, they were paid based on the service that they provided. So they were being paid for the quantity of services. If, they, um, if a doctor saw 10 patients, he got 10 payments for those 10 patients. Um, it, so it was really based on, on the volume. Well, we want to move toward a system now that's paying for value. So it's not just the paying providers for the quantity of services that they're providing, but it's provide, also accounting for that quality of services that gets provided. Many people and organizations and experts put out the definition of value as being something that considers the effects of those treatments and services that are provided versus the cost of those treatments and services. And that's a very common definition that gets used out there. Um, and it's not always agreed upon, but that's the way to think about value. And, and we actually think that the patient community thinks about value a little bit differently than a straightforward mathematical calculation. But there are many people out there who really think about value as a straightforward mathematical calculation. But as you realize, that measuring value is very complex, and it depends on the perspective. So when you think about it, um, uh, what, what are the effects that would get put into this calculation? Um, effects from whose perspective? And what are the costs that get put into this calculation? And whose costs are they? Are patients' costs considered in there? Is it only the insurer's costs? What about the cost of uh, lost work time? So that's part of what makes calculating value um, in, the economic, uh, in the healthcare environment such a complicated thing because value is, means different things to different people and um, it's complicated to determine what are the effects that get put into this calculation and what are the costs that get put into this calculation. So what are value frameworks and assessments? These are really tools that are out there to help inform different stakeholders about the costs and benefits of different treatments or services. Very typically, they're looking at new treatments versus old treatments or new treatments versus the standard of care. Um, but it, these are tools that get used to help someone make those determinations. These are not new tools. So for example, the term health technology assessment or HTA is something that gets used outside of the US quite frequently. So for example, it gets used by the organization called NICE in the United Kingdom and it makes those determinations for the people who get their benefits under the national health system of the United Kingdom. Um, in the U.S., health insurers have been making these value determinations using these kinds of tools for, for quite a long time. Um, they were just doing it in an internal basis, so it was something that was being done internally within a, an insurance organization or within a provider organization, and it wasn't something that was known publicly, and it wasn't something that was treated very transparently. So, for example, these things weren't free, very frequently published or really were not very frequently mentioned in the media. There are different frameworks in the U.S. Um, now, and these vary by audience and goals and methods. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the more popular and more well-known ones in the U.S. that are being discussed today. But just to, just to reiterate, um, very often what happens with these frameworks is that data is collected from the environment. It could be all kinds of different data. Typically, it's clinical trial data, but it can be other kinds of data. It's fed into the framework, the framework that, the, um, that these developers have put together. And as I said, they vary and they are different, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how they differ. What comes out of the framework is an assessment. It's a value assessment. And very often that value assessment is put out publicly in the form of a report. So let's talk a little bit more about what these value frameworks are intended to do. There are some pros to thinking about value frameworks. The idea of it is that it's supposed to encourage treatment that produces better health care. So it's supposed to help people make better choices by having a better sense of those benefits and costs that are being balanced out. Um, so that's a good thing. We want, we want people to be, to be making better health choices. It can also enhance the national dialogue on the value of care because it's um, you know, something that we want to achieve is this idea of paying for value rather than paying for quantity of care. And then it can help different audiences identify what's best for them 
and best, uh, a best treatment for them to help them make those better choices. But we have to keep in mind that, that that's usually done on average. So it would be on average what's best for someone like me. There are some cons. Um, very often the value frameworks that we've seen and the value assessments that have been produced have had limited patient input. And that's something that we're trying to turn around. So with a, with, a, with a webinar like the one that we're having today, it's to help patients understand and patient groups understand uh, what these things are and how they can become more engaged in this process so that we can overcome the limited amount of input that patients have had. Some question whether or not using value frameworks might be a formalized form of rationing and um, that uh, a, a value framework that produces a value assessment and gets put into a report could be used as some kind of cut point to determine whether or not someone has access to care. And so there is that concern. As I mentioned earlier, another con is that the various kinds of uh, value frameworks that are out there vary considerably, and they don't necessarily agree. And that's because we really don't have very clear best practices of how to do this or the measures of value, and people don't agree on that either. And the, one of the things that's very complicated, that gets very controversial when we talk about value frameworks, is that one of the things that some of these frameworks try to do is determine the, the value of a life, a life's worth. And very often they're doing that without enough societal input. And that is something that um, certainly can be very concerning to the patient community, especially when you think about um, people who have chronic illnesses and disabilities. So as I said earlier, we're going to talk a little bit about the value frameworks that have gotten a lot of attention lately. Um, so here are some that you may have heard from. I'll just introduce them briefly. The ASCO, A-S-C-O, is the American Society of Clinical Oncology and they put out a value framework on oncology treatments. NCCN is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. They also put out a framework for cancer treatments. The um, American College of Cardiology put out a framework on uh, treatments that are used in cardiac disease. The Drug Pricing Lab is a department of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, and they also put out a framework with regard to cancer treatments. The Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, ICER, is one of the more known organizations, and it has uh, put out a number of value assessments using their value framework approach, and they put their assessments out on a variety of different kinds of topics. So while it includes oncology, it also goes beyond oncology. Another group that's working on a, a project called Innovation and Value Initiative the IVI initiative um, is just at the beginning stages of putting out a value framework, um, and that is one that has not gotten as much attention because it is relatively new and it's working toward trying to have patient engagement in their approaches. The last one that I'll mention is work that's being done by two organizations in collaboration with one another. That is Faster Cures and Avalier, and they're working together to, to produce a, um, a, a patient-centered value framework approach. And that is also something that is very new. You may not have heard of that one. And we're going to talk about that one briefly um, in a few minutes. So let's begin with ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. I'm just going to go at a, a very high level and review the approaches that ICER uses. ICER begins by looking at comparative clinical effectiveness, um, it looks at incremental cost uh, for the outcomes, the longer-term outcomes, if they can find them, that are in the com uh, comparative clinical assessment that they have done. They try to consider other benefits or disadvantages in their framework. And then they also have something that they call contextual considerations. And very often, it's those contextual considerations that are the things that are the most important to patients and patient groups and involve things like quality of life and functioning and caregiver burden. At the end of that process, they produce um, their assessment of care value. Uh, they have public discussion with a committee that is formed to have this discussion, um, and they have a vote on whether or not they believe that this product has the, or this new treatment, has the care value at a high, intermediate, or low level. Um, they, they then begin another process. There's another step to this process. 
So when that information is gathered, they then take a look at what is the impact on the budget of a health system if it were to um, introduce this treatment into their system. So it's taking a shorter term look at what might happen if this new treatment was adopted by an organization. What's the impact on its budget? And it comes up with the provisional health system value. They then have a process where there is a public discussion on this, but there's no vote or um, any formal, formal designation that comes out of that discussion. And then the information is fed into a policy roundtable discussion where invited individuals speak about what the policy implications are for this, um, this, uh, this consideration about the budget impact and, um, and then how that information might be used. And this is an, another place in the, uh, this is a place in the uh, system where consumers and others can contribute to that discussion, but unfortunately there is no change in the vote that happens at that process. The vote has already been taken and that's already been established. Um, if you are interested in more information about that process, you can always go to the ICER website and they'll give you more information. Basically what we've introduced here is a high level overview of their process as they discuss it. A little bit more information about ICER, and this is information that they provide themselves on their website. So this is certainly not our um, assessment of what they say about themselves, but it's really more about what they say about themselves. And we're presenting this just to be able to give you a comparison about what these groups are saying about their own approaches. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the pros and cons of some of this. Um, ICER introduces itself as having it up, but being geared toward particular audience of payers, patients, and doctors, that they consider all treatments, and that they focus on those potentially large impacts. So usually going after the most expensive treatments, the high dollar treatments that are new and being introduced. Um, they, it's looked at as an approach for payers to analyze and judge value. So this is, how, this is the way that they describe the audience that they're targeting. And even though they do list patients, they really don't have um, a mechanism for introducing this information to patients and are, um, are, are think, believing that patients will um, get this information through their, through their contact with their, um, with their health system and with their doctors. They describe their methods as uh, CEA studies, so cost effectiveness analysis studies of new technologies and cost um, uh, cost effectiveness, uh, comparative effectiveness studies of new technologies compared to standard alternatives. Um, they estimate the price that would be needed for that product in order for the treatment to be cost effective. That's the approach that they take. Um, but again, remember what I said earlier, that in any of these mathematical co calculations, it depends on what and whose costs that go into the model in order for it to, um, to be able to, for that calculation to be able to be made, and that's where a lot of variability comes in. They also estimate budget impact. So as we were talking about on the previous slide, it's the impact on the budget of a particular organization if they were to institute something like this within that, that organization? What would the budget impact be? They do state that they consider contextual and other considerations, and as I said earlier, that's usually where the things that are most important to patients come in. And one of the things to keep in mind is that when they do incorporate these contextual considerations in, they're, they're considered as part of the, the narrative and the conversation around the assessment, but it's not quantitatively incorporated into that mathematical, uh, that mathematical calculation. It's something that's considered um, as a sidebar. And then the expert, experts vote on the, evidences, uh, in the evidence of care value. In terms of what ICER says about its own rigor, it says that it uses a variety of evidence and practices for cost-effectiveness analysis. It uses those formal mathematical models with what's called sensitivity analysis, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the second webinar in the series so that you'll have a little bit better understanding about what these things are. And they produce a cost per quality, a cost per quality adjusted life year, and that comes out as an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. 
And again, this is some of that trickier terminology that we're not going to dig into today, but we're going to dig into the next time around. And so that's the approach that they take, and, um, and they present it as a rigorous method. Next, we'll talk about the American Society of Clinical Oncology's approach. They talk about how they take clinical benefits, and since they're talking about oncology, that's very frequently seen as overall survival or progression-free survival or response rate. From that, they want to take out the toxicity. Um, they want to look at the frequency and severity of toxicity because um, you can't just look at those positives without considering the downside, the toxicities. And then they consider what they call bonus attributes, um, and it's things like uh, palliation, quality of life, treatment-free interval, what they call the tail of the curve. Um, and that is all used to calculate the net health benefits. And typically, it is considered relative to a particular treatment comparison, and it is looked at um, when they're looking at the data, they are considering only randomized clinical trials that, that they're doing this assessment based on. And they have a point system, so it's out of this point system that they're trying to get this calculation in order to gauge this net health benefit based on a number of points. So um, just in the last year, ASCO put out a 2.0 version of their framework, so it's the updated version, and they are talking about putting out a 3.0 version sometime in the near future. They describe their audience as cancer doctors and cancer patients. And um, they describe their methodology as producing this net health score. It's that composite score of benefit, toxicity, and those bonus points out of 120. And this is presented alongside the drug price and the patient copayments. Now again, remember, in any of these mathematical calculations, there has to be a consideration of uh, of what's going in there and where the information is coming from um, in order for these calculations to be done. And sometimes they will be um, something that will ap apply to a particular patient and population, but sometimes they may, may be something that's not quite relevant um, and that other, other numbers should have been used or might potentially be used in that sensitivity analysis if they're doing one. In terms of their own rigor, um, they say that it simplifies the results of complex clinical trials because, remember, they are only using clinical trials, um, and, they, uh, and we have to keep in mind that when trials are published, they're not all standardized. They don't all use the same methods. They don't all use the same reporting. They don't all use the same outcome endpoints. So there can be quite a lot of variability there. And typically, the focus will be on overall survival uh, because that's believed to be the, the, most important, the most important end point. Next, we're going to switch to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network framework. And similar to ASCO's approach, they take these uh, uh, estimations of efficacy, the quality of the evidence that they're looking at, so the quality of the studies, and again, clinical trials that they're looking at. They look at the affordability of the treatment. They consider safety, so similar to ASCO where they're talking about toxicity, they consider safety, and they look at the consistency of the evidence. So, you know, are, are, do studies tend to look at, uh, produce the same results, or are, is there widely conflicting evidence? Now, you will see here we've got um, uh, across the bottom of these boxes to the right-hand side, this is the product that gets produced um, from this framework. And you'll see E relates to efficacy, S relates to safety, Q relates to quality, C relates to consistency of evidence, and A relates to affordability. And they make this matrix by giving points to each of these boxes. Um, and they are scored based on a five-point scale. So the bottom line of this framework is that the more blue boxes that you have and the more that that framework is filled in, then the more positive are the attributes for that treatment or product. So the, the NCCN, when it talks about its, um, its, pr its, its framework, it calls it evidence blocks because it goes with that matrix. The audience that they say that they are targeting is cancer clinicians and patients. Again, their method is this scoring 
of those five characteristics on a scale of one to five, and they are efficacy, safety, quality of evidence, consistency of evidence, and affordability. And they take the average of the expert panel's scores, they are rounded, and the results are presented graphically, presented in that matrix of blue boxes. When they talk about their own rigor, they say that the scores come from panels, interpretation of the literature, of the NCC guidelines that the National Can Comprehensive Cancer Network produces, and from the clinical experience of those clinicians. Um, they, they, all, of, all of the domains, those five domains, are equally weighted, and they only use direct costs. They don't consider things about uh, indirect costs, quality of life, productivity, those kinds of things. And this is basically a picture of what the evidence blocks look like. And as I said, more blue boxes means um, a better assessment for that new treatment. I'm going to talk a little bit about the drug pricing lab. Um, they also use a similar approach with efficacy, um, the, the cost for the development of the product, again, toxicity, rarity of the condition, novelty of the treatment, the population burden, and the prognosis. And it produces what's called the drug abacus, or the abacus price, because the, uh, the, the um, output of this calculation is what the price of the product theoretically should be. Um, they also they produce categories of prices, a price for the VA, for the Veterans Administration, a price for Medicare, and then a UK price for the United Kingdom. So what do they say about themselves? They call the framework the drug advocates. The audience is a little bit difficult to discern. They, it's, potentially all audiences, because their objective is to create a tool to determine appropriate prices for cancer drugs. They describe their methodology, methodology as a web-based tool for individuals to input their preferences into those categories that we discussed on the previous slide, and it computes a value-based price, and they've done this for 150 cancer drugs. It compares the prices paid by Medicare, Veterans Affairs, and the UK. Um, again, on that level of rigor, they report in terms of their own work. It uses mostly randomized control evidence with a level of evidence grade that's given to that evidence, and it allows the users to see how, when they change those preferences on those different elements, how it can impact the price which they uh, discern as, as value. So this is an example of um, how you might go to their web page and do this modifiable uh, activity on the price and reset. And you can go in and plug in your own numbers into any of these different attributes um, to come up with what that price should be. Now I'm going to go to one that you, um, you probably haven't heard much about, and that's the Faster Cures Aval Avalier framework. There are five domains in what they call their patient perspective value framework and they have come out with the first version just this past year. The domains are quality and applicability of the evidence, patient preferences, patient-centered outcomes, and patient and family costs, and then usability and transparency. Those are the elements of this framework. Um, as I said earlier, they're just beginning to work on this, and so they don't have the level of detail in how someone would actually execute on this to create a score or a report, but they talk about the applications and how this can be, work, can be used. It can be used to um, look at shared decision-making or improve shared decision-making as a tool to support those kinds of activities. It can be used and applied to existing frameworks. So taking a, one of the previous frameworks that we talked about and reframing it um, with, from the patient perspective. It can be used to support public health care programs, um, strategic internal analyses in terms of, um, of uh, uh, it being applied to um, uh, future and condition-specific kinds of applications. And then it can be, um, and then the, the next step is to think about um, what are the applications that future versions of this same framework might be applied to as they begin to develop this and it progresses further um, in its thinking and its application and use. 
But as I said, this is still in the very early stages, and then there's still more work to be done on this one. Uh, just a little bit of background on a landscape assessment that we did here, where um, we looked at landscape, we looked at assess, uh, value assessments across the U.S. and across other countries. And what we found in general is that there's very little consistency in the terms and the definitions that gets used, that get used, and that can cause a lot of confusion. Um, there's also not very much patient engagement, and to the, to the extent that there is patient engagement, it's often referred to as, um, very vaguely, as uh, engagement with external experts, the uh, availability for public consultation, and the availability for anyone to comment during an open comment period. And so um, while those are not very, those are really not very direct in terms of patient engagement, it's, uh, those opportunities are a little bit more indirect. And we found that um, many, and in fact most, did not directly seek patient input, but we also see that over the last year that has been changing and that many are beginning to implement more ways of direct patient engagement. So what should patients and advocates look for in value assessment? Um, there are some important questions here. How do you know good from bad? Um, well, we at the National Health Council have put together some, uh, some tools that uh, patient advocacy groups and, and patients can use. Uh, we have the National Health Council rubric that is a tool that can be used to as a guide, as, and look at it as guiding principles. Um, and that can really be used to assess whether or not patient centeredness is there in the framework, whether or not patient engagement happened in a particular assessment, and what the quality of that engagement was. And then we also have what we call the NHC Get Ready Checklist, which can help a patient group get prepared for engagement um, with any of these organizations. And uh, we're going to be talking about these in more detail as we go into the next, uh, the, the next few webinars that will happen as part of the series. And in particular, the last webinar will be dedicated to looking at the tools. I want to just close my presentation with giving you a quick overview of a, um, of a, a, a case study. This is the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. They are part of the MS Coalition. They were very involved in providing comment to ICER on ICER's assessment in relapsing, remitting, and primary pro progressive multiple sclerosis, um, which was released in March of this past year. Um, and they were very, very engaged in this. They provided comment at every official opportunity, and they had many informal conversations with ICER. Um, they created an online questionnaire to assess patient perspectives, and they were able to gather that data very quickly and provide it to ICER, and it was incorporated into the ICER report. And their impact, they believe, was that patient perspectives were included in the narrative of the report and that the CTAF, which is the committee that did the voting, um, the members of that committee cited patient considerations as being top of mind for them when they were actually conducting their vote. So now I want to take a moment and introduce our guest speakers. We have Annie Kennedy, who is Senior Vice President, Legislative and Public Policy at Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. And we have Paul Melmeyer, Director of Federal Policy, National Organization for Rare Disorders. And we're going to ask, uh, we've asked Annie and Paul to join us today to talk about their individual experiences with value framework developers and people who produce these value assessment reports. Annie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> thanks for having us today. Um, so ours is not a case study around a specific um, value assessment of a specific product, but um, more a story that I guess we're in the midst of that. So in November of 2015, ICER um, did some forecasting for products that they would be reviewing over the next six to 12 months. And when they published that list, there were three Duchenne products that were anticipated to be reviewed by the FDA in the coming year that were on ICER's list for review. So at that time, we began familiarizing ourselves with the ICER value framework, um, starting to understand what inputs would or would not be considered. And, you know, going back to that slide that Eleanor showed earlier on when she was describing the ICER framework, trying to understand how in the cases of um, the Duchenne products that were being um, reviewed at the FDA um, and in rare diseases in general, how some of the um, challenges that had been faced by drug developers would be considered within the context of the ICER framework. So for example, within the ICER framework, that first bar for 
um, their framework or their criteria consideration is the comparative clinical effectiveness. And in rare diseases and in the case of one of the products that was being reviewed at FDA, there was an accelerated approval pathway being sought. So we were going to have a circumstance where there were going to be very small trials and very limited trial data that was reviewed, and that the trial data would be reviewed based on a surrogate endpoint, not clinical endpoints. So right there, we might be at a disadvantage for the ICER framework. So we began reaching out to ICER um, to dialogue with them, and to talk with them, and to also talk with them about Within PPMD and within our community, there's been so much work done around this patient, around patient-focused drug development, around the development of PROs and patient-reported outcomes, around we've written guidance, around tools that um, benefit risk and patient preference studies that are quality, quantitative and qualitative data that have really rigid and rigorous methodology behind them. And again, wanted to understand, would there be a place within the framework for some of this data to be considered and brought forward? The other challenge that we had is that, again, when we looked at the framework, um, they immediately start to look at incremental cost for better clinical outcomes. And in our disease and many rare diseases, there are real barriers for tracking longitudinal outcomes um, because there may not be a specific ICD code we work with the CDC on a national surveillance program, and PPMD has led the development of this very sophisticated calculated variable in order to confirm cases of Duchenne across the surveillance system. But how was ICER going to tackle this and do this? Um, we've been a part of um, publishing burden of disease studies, but would that be accounted for when looking at that data? And so, again, we started this dialogue with ICER. What ended up happening was that the regulatory timelines change for product reviews, as they often do, and um, but our conversation with ICER continued. And what we got to was, I think, a, a mutual understanding on ICER's part and ours that perhaps when talking about products for orphan diseases and orphan and rare communities, this ICER framework might not fit, and perhaps it was worth taking another look at this and seeing whether or not some adjustments needed to be made to the framework. And so we started having conversations around what other inputs might need to be um, collected and considered and at which time points. And so what ICER opted to do was ICER put together a summit in this past May, in May of 2017 called the Orphan Drug Assessment and Pricing Summit. And leading up to that summit, ICER put together a working group and invited us to be a part of that working group and also invited NORD and um, some of our other partners, Cure SMA. SMA had had um, a really wonderful breakthrough therapy approved and so it was in a similar situation as Duchenne and some others to be a part of that working group to be very thoughtful about what else should go into this summit, who should be a part of it, what should be considered. And then ICER put together a white paper, a briefing document in advance of the summit as well. Um, and out of that summit and out of that conversation came um, a proposal for an adjusted framework. And the comment period for that closes on Monday. <clears throat> we as an organization will certainly be commenting. Um, we are very happy that ICER has um, been so thoughtful and been so engaged with our community as well as so many others. Um, we do see in their proposal some of what we've been talking about reflected. However, m many of our concerns are still not necessarily resolved in the proposed framework. And maybe I'll reserve the conversation for after Paul's presentation because I think Paul and I will probably share some of the same comments and we can bat that back and forth a little bit. Um, but just leave it here to say that we have not yet had a, pro a product review for a Duchenne product, um, and this is sort of a, a work in progress with ICER. Um, but we've been, we have been appreciative of the engagement with ICER and their recognition that, um, that orphan products are a different animal. One of the things, though, that's on the table right now is to create a designation between an orphan disease and an ultra-orphan disease. And um, that is something that we as a community 
don't feel is appropriate um, and necessary, and we don't think that there should be a diversion from the definition of orphan communities and orphan products as laid out in the Orphan Drug Act. Um, and we can go into the whys again in the discussion if you'd like to. So I guess with that, maybe I'll turn it over to Paul to talk about Nord's experiences. Thanks, Annie. Paul, we're going to pass the ball to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Annie, and thank you, Eleanor. Um, and again, thank you very much for inviting me to participate today. Um, I am uh, the Director of Federal Policy at the National Organization for Rare Disorders. And for those of you who may be unfamiliar with us, we're a, a rare disease patient organization that um, represents all 30 million Americans with uh, rare diseases and offer a variety of services um, to the rare disease patient population. And um, with the preponderance of value assessment frameworks uh, within the last year or two, we found that it is uh, very important to represent the rare disease patient perspective as these value assessment frameworks are developed and as they are used on orphan therapies. So what I want to use my few minutes on the webinar today on um, is to really focus mostly on the ICER process. And that's simply because we've been most involved in the ICER process, so I really can um, speak uh, best to the, the work they're doing, doing there. So as Annie already discussed uh, just a bit, um, ICER within the last um, eight months or so have announced that they are looking at rare diseases and orphan therapies uh, specifically, uh, kind of taking a second look at those, I suppose, after they finalized their value assessment framework um, back in the spring for, um, I suppose, all the rest of the uh, drugs that they would be uh, potentially reviewing. And then following that, they also at the same time announced that we're going to take a second look at uh, rare diseases to be sure that our value assessment framework is adequate to review orphans and to put forward a uh, accurate and valid uh, assessment of the value of that orphan therapy. So leading up to the May 31st meeting that they held, um, that Annie already touched on just a bit, they did put forward a uh, white paper. And within that white paper, we found kind of three main questions that they posed to the community. And that is, you know, how do we define an orphan? Um, or do we need to define an ultra-orphan, essentially? Um, the second is, do treatments for rare diseases deserve special treatment, in a sense? And the third being, should a value framework for orphan therapies be structured differently? So moving on to the next slide, um, in regards to how we define a rare disease, there are already set definitions in statute in uh, most places around the world. Of course, here in the United States, it's uh, the definition of a rare disease is any disease that affects 200,000 individuals or fewer in the United States. Over in Europe, they use a ratio system in which um, the prevalence must be uh, 50 per 100,000 individuals or fewer to, in order to qualify for uh, uh, as status as a rare a disease or as an orphan treatment. And in Japan, they actually have a uh, much smaller prevalence that they use, a prevalence of uh, 50,000 individuals or fewer, which makes sense since they're a much smaller uh, country, of course. So these are the statutory definitions for the most part, uh, maybe regulatory in other places, but set legal definitions of a rare disease across the world, and there are others in other countries. Um, however, when it comes to do we, how do we define an ultra-orphan disease, the United States has no definition. Um, there's no definition in statute, there's no definition in regulation, there's no official definition anywhere. And that actually is largely true around the world as well. There are very few set definitions of what an ultra-orphan disease is. And then to get to the question of should we create an ultra-orphan definition, NORD has long said no, that we should not create an ultra-orphan designation, and this is for uh, several reasons. We've seen the ultra-orphan idea come up in a variety of circumstances, a variety of policy areas that could be within FDA review. Perhaps a certain subset of rare diseases should go on a different track of FDA review if they qualify for an ultra-orphan. We've seen this with incentives. Perhaps ultra-orphans should be incentivized further uh, than non-ultra-orphans in a sense. And we've also seen this conversation in reimbursement policy. But what we've long found is that when we start to subdivide the rare disease patient community into orphan and ultra-orphan, we believe that those who do not qualify for ultra-orphan status, actually perhaps more harm would be done to them than help would be done to the ultra-orphans, that 
in a sense, the um, you know, incentives or uh, additional assistance that may be given to all rare diseases this, at this point, if there are non-ultra orphans now within the community, that um, those could be uh, decided to, to be lessened or disincentivized, or uh, we're just not convinced that the, of any proposal of this sort would do more, more good than harm. And, and that does extend into, um, into value assessment frameworks. And, you know, we have additional reasons for this. Um, first of all, just having a set prevalence number, a set cutoff within the ICER proposal, the, the cutoff is 10,000 individuals or fewer to, to qualify as an ultra orphan. We don't believe that this is really the, the, the most nuanced or best reflecting of uh, the situation that rare disease uh, patients or uh, development into orphan therapies uh, currently find themselves in. For example, uh, Gaucher's disease, which affects approximately one in 100,000 individuals, has several treatments, whereas um, amyotrophic uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, has uh, affects about four in 100,000 individuals. So the prevalence is four times as much, yet ALS just saw their very first drug approved in over 20 years just earlier this year. And so completely different situations for two different disease states, um, yet the prevalence numbers, ALS, the disease that has four times as many individuals has that fewer treatments. So again, just facing the, uh, you know, a subdivision of the orphan population even further uh, needs to have a more nuanced approach. Um, so to move on to the next slide, the second question that ICER raises is, do treatments for rare diseases deserve special treatment? Uh, we say no, that treatments for rare diseases don't deserve special treatment per se. But should they be treated differently? And, and we say yes to this. And this is mainly because there are inherent market failures due to the small patient populations that arise with rare diseases. And we see this uh, reflected in many laws that have been passed over the last, uh, well, let's say 35 years um, that try to address the market failures that come about as a result of a small patient population. I mean, the Orphan Drug Act, of course, is one of the best examples. It was found that without additional assistance, there would be very, very little development into rare diseases. And so with the Orphan Drug Act, with special treatment in a sense, um, now there is a robust development within orphans. In addition to other considerations on how rare diseases should be treated differently, um, with uh, methodology constraints, uh, small patient populations inherently make valuations used within cost-effectiveness analysis, cost-utility analysis more difficult to make because there are that fewer individuals and that fewer data to contribute to an assessment. In addition to that, uh, rare diseases oftentimes show an increase in heterogeneity of the condition and the symptoms as well as uh, the uh, treatment effects within the disease. Um, oftentimes, there is a, just an inherent lack of scientific understanding around a rare disease. There is oftentimes very little research actually put into that disease. We, we know of many uh, diseases uh, that, that we, of course, represent when the, in which there is absolutely no research being uh, conducted within that disease state. Oftentimes, rare diseases are more prevalent within children. We estimate that about two-thirds of all rare diseases do affect children. and. Um, about 50% of individuals in the United States with a rare disease are children. And then finally, there is uh, just a stark lack of alternative therapies within rare diseases. About 95% of rare diseases have no treatment. So that very first treatment for that disease uh, is, is just so incredibly important uh, compared to maybe the seventh or eighth treatment for a, a common disease. So these are all kind of unique characteristics within rare diseases specifically that we do believe need to be recognized within the development of value assessment frameworks. And if we move on to the next slide, um, this kind of continues along with this. Uh, should a value framework for orphan therapies be structured differently? And, and we say yes. First, to address the methodological um, concerns um, in regards to small patient populations, uh, just to get maybe just a little bit into the weeds, and I understand this will likely be covered more within the uh, next webinar around kind of the, the basic uh, structure and theory and uh, methodology behind uh, value assessment frameworks. When it comes to doing incremental cost effectiveness ratios um, in which you compare the uh, therapy with, let's say, the next best therapy and see what the incremental improvement is between the two, 
for rare diseases, oftentimes there is no other alternative treatment. Um, there is nothing to compare the treatment to, and the baseline, the, uh, the standard of care, in a sense, for rare disease patients uh, is, is not particularly well quantified and not particularly well understood, making these incremental cost effectiveness ratios more difficult to develop. In addition, uh, the heterogeneity of the condition and treatment effects needs to be uh, included within the value assessment framework as well as recognition of the lack of scientific understanding behind um, the, treat, uh, the, the, the diseases and the potential for additional comorbidities or perhaps gene interactions. Um, when it comes to incorporating qualities or improvements in quality adjusted life years, um, when it comes to, in a sense, kind of quantifying uh, the disease states between zero and one as qualities do, uh, there, that quantification often isn't involving the rare disease patients themselves. It's involving people who do not have that particular disease, um, which could potentially skew specifically where on the zero to one scale that uh, quality adjusted life years for that rare disease is placed. Um, and then in addition, the recognition of lack of alternative therapies and just how important that first therapy is for a population should be reflected within a value assessment framework. Um, as should the value of scientific advancement um, that a further development into rare diseases brings. I mean, we understand that many, uh, in many instances, uh, research into certain rare diseases has led to breakthroughs in, uh, in common diseases. You know, for example, researching progeria or researching frontotemporal degeneration has led to uh, uh, advancements and breakthroughs in understanding diseases such as Alzheimer's or understanding even aging for that matter, uh, as research into progeria has done. So to move on to my uh, final slide here, which gets back to ICER specifically, and that is does ICER appropriately amend their value framework for rare diseases? As Annie already alluded to, they have included some beneficial aspects within uh, their proposed value assessment framework for orphan therapies, but there are still things that we have concerns with. In regards to things that we are pleased to see within their proposal, they do uh, propose to factor in additional uncertainty to kind of recognize the lack of data or lack of understanding around rare diseases. Um, they do expand the willingness to pay threshold uh, upwards to perhaps factor in um, the willingness to pay for that very first rare disease treatment or just for treatments for rare diseases in general. And they do broaden the other benefit and uh, disadvantage section that they already have within their uh, current framework. Uh, however, they still also include other problematic aspects, at least aspects that we view as problematic. They are proposing to move forward with an ultra-orphan distinction. That would be 10,000 individuals or fewer. Um, they are only factoring in uh, unique situations that rare disease uh, therapies and rare disease situations bring contextually and qualitatively rather than quantitatively. Uh, meaning that within any report they do for an orphan therapy, they will use virtually the same value assessment framework as they would for a common disease therapy, but then in the language that they include within the report, uh, offer why this may be different or why this uh, rare disease treatment may deserve special uh, circumstances, but that number will still uh, be the same. They'll still use the same methodology to produce that number that they'll often uh, offer to uh, the general public, um, as so that they use the same uh, value-based price benchmark as they do for common diseases, um, and they uh, use the same timeline and framework for patient engagement. This kind of gets away from methodology just a bit, but under the current framework that they use, uh, they only have a very short amount of time for patient organizations to participate within the development of these value assessment frameworks, oftentimes maybe only three weeks to comment on a scoping document or to comment on the, you know, the initial draft of the value assessment. Now, this, we believe, could be particularly problematic for rare disease patients and patient organizations because um, they're that much smaller. 70% of NORS membership of the 260 member organizations that we represent have fewer than five full-time employees. So if they all of a sudden are asked to participate within this process, and this is a very arduous and esoteric process, then all of a sudden uh, the burden to participate is, is just that much higher. So we've asked ICER to incorporate, to recognize that additional burden that rare disease patient organizations would have to face within participating within the processes. So I'm going to close there, and I realize I went over time, but 
Um, I'm looking forward to any uh, questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Annie and Paul. I really, really appreciate your providing your real-world experiences in all of this. Um, we have not had um, very many questions come in. I think um, the only uh, question that, that I've got that uh, has come forward is for Annie and Paul. Um, what, could you both talk a little bit about what impact you think um, you've had and, and really what the benefit has been to your organization in being involved? Because I understand that you know, there's a, you've, you've got to weigh um, the amount of uh, burden and resources that you've put into the kind of work that you're doing, but um, you get something back for that. And it would be, I think it would be nice to talk a little bit about the benefit that you've seen from being engaged. I mean, I, I can begin. Um, so I think to begin with, we when this first began for us, um, we were, it was probably late 2014, the beginning of 2015 when we started learning about value frameworks and there there wasn't a lot of um, energy in the community around value frameworks. So National Health Council was really just starting this work, if I'm remembering correctly. And so the value for us at that time was um, National Health Council bringing together some partners who were already working in this space. And so there was um, the MS groups, which you cited as a case study, the National Psoriasis Foundation, um, was at that time doing their work, which is an incredible case study that um, should be shown, and I'm sure you have shown. They might be on a future webinar. Um, the familial hypercholesterolemia community was um, in the midst of some work with ICER. And so we just had colleagues that we were learning from in real time and had the opportunity to be working with National Health Council on the development of the Get Ready Checklist. And so we were literally, and you know, it's overused, but we were, you know, building the plane as we were flying it from our perspective from the Duchenne community. Um, our engagement with ICER certainly was beneficial in that, you know, we think it had a tremendous impact on the fact that there was a summit around orphan products and a hard look at the framework once the um, more widely used framework had been updated. What what impact it will have, I think, is still to be seen, dependent on what gets finalized. Um, and I think Paul just did a beautiful job articulating, you know, what's still up for discussion and some of the concerns we still have. One of the others I would just like to highlight, and going a little off your question, though, and Paul touched on it, was this question of timing um, and the question of stakeholder engagement. And there are areas where they talk about that there will be stakeholders consulted, um, whether it's to add to the, con the contextual um, summaries that they'll add around that number that they report or um, various stakeholders that they'll consult, you know, at this point and that point. But they're very vague about who those stakeholders are. And we've had a lot of concern about, you know, that those stakeholders, whether they are clinical experts or patient community members, be people who are expert in the condition that that product is designed to benefit. And that becomes, that's important for any condition, but becomes even more important when you're talking about rare diseases. And that has not been something that we have found any of these um, value frameworks, and I'm gonna pull it back from ICER, because I think it's everybody's doing it, to necessarily make a habit of yet. And so we're concerned about that. And the other question is a question of timing, that these, when are these value frameworks conducted? And if they're conducted right on the heels of a product being approved, that again, how much clinical data will you have? How will we know, you know, what the longitudinal outcome will be if we don't have a well, if some of these diseases that aren't well documented that we don't have a lot of burden of disease data on? And ICER does not have methodology for going back again and doing another assessment. And that was something that was raised at the summit and was not addressed. And so it, in the case of some of these products for rare diseases, we would, we would like to make the case that this may not be a one point in time assessment that needs to be done, but we, we may need to go back and look at these again because we will learn a lot more about these diseases and about who's living with these diseases once there are therapies available. People will go to their doctors to be diagnosed and re-identified or will learn more about the phenotypes and the genotypes because now there are therapies available. And so we, we, that will shift. Um, so anyway, 
the impact is yet to be seen, I guess is the answer to that. It's an evolving impact. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. We're able to keep the line open for a little while longer, and Annie and Paul, if you're um, able to stay, we welcome you to stay on the line. If, you're, if you have to drop off because of other commitments, we certainly understand. Um, for those of you who are on the line, we're happy to keep the line open a few minutes longer for Q&A. I just wanted to um, wrap up with a few closing remarks before we do that, but please feel free to stay on the line. Um, the webinar has been recorded, and it's going to be posted on the National Health Council website, so you're welcome to come back and take a look at it later or share it with a colleague who might want to take a look at it. Please remember part two is October 25th from 3 to 4, and again, I want to thank Amgen who helped make this program possible. Um, and so with those closing announcements, um, I will actually turn to Paul, if he's still able to stay on, to answer the same question that Annie just answered. Sure, no problem. So I think Annie uh, answered it quite well. I, I don't really have too much additional to add. I, I would say that what we have seen um, as, as beneficial with our engagement is that we actually have seen the uh, ICER value assessment framework move in a direction that we believe is a much improved direction and is much more patient friendly. Now, it's not all the way there, as, as I already detailed, but as, as, as we talk to patient organizations that participated within ICER, um, and in ICER procedures, I suppose, in, in let's say 2013, 14, 15, um, we, we heard a, a pretty frustrated patient community. And what we've now seen within the last uh, 12 to 18 months or so is uh, patient communities and patient organizations such as National Psoriasis Foundation and National MS Society um, who have been fully involved and uh, much more involved than they were, um, than organizations were prior. Um, so not, not to say that that's, you know, resulting from our engagement by any means, but it's, it's just as a, it's in a result, it's as a result of patient organizations engaging in general. Um, and then in addition to that, we understand that this is a, an incredibly complicated issue and, and we want to be there for our patient community and our patient organizations who perhaps don't have a PhD in, in health economics or maybe just t took that one microeconomic course back in college or something like that and now they're being asked to understand qualities and cost effectiveness uh, studies and ICERs and all that good stuff. Um, we, we find participating within these initiatives as a very beneficial so that we can do our very best to try to distill what's important down to the patient community and to the patient organization community we represent. Thanks, Paul. Um, we do have another question that's come in, and, and the question is um, r with regard to the role of the pharmaceutical industry on this topic and how and when should companies engage with advocacy organizations and what is the expectation of advocacy organizations um, of the pharmaceutical industry on this topic. Um, Annie, Annie and Paul, do you want to, do you have any uh, reaction to that or any, um, any response to that, those questions about the role of the pharmaceutical companies or interactions that you've had with them about these topics? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I can take a crack at this. So in the Duchenne space, we have more than 40 publicly and privately traded companies, and we maintain, um, I think, really positive relationships with all of those companies all across the drug development pipeline. I can say, though, that our interactions and um, work around the value frameworks and work with ICER has been completely independent from our work with the companies. And so, and it's not that there's necessarily a firewall, but we actually haven't been working with the companies around this much at all. When the um, announcement about the summit came out, we shared it with the companies to make sure that they knew that the summit was coming. And then when ICER pushed out um, the proposed um, framework changes and the call for comment, we again disseminated that to our companies to make sure that they were aware of it. But to that end, that has been really the only engagement that we have facilitated or been in the middle of. This just isn't a conversation we're having with companies. Um, or that has been a part of our engagement with the companies. We just see this as a part of our advocating for um, access and helping ensure a more positive access environment and a, a value measure that's reflected of, reflective of the patient experience. PPMD's done, as I mentioned before, burden of disease studies. We've worked to have a specific ICD code. This just sort of falls into our work as an organization and it's outside of our specific engagement with the companies. So our engagement with ICER was something that we took on as an organization. 
Paul, any comment to add? You know, I, I don't think I could say it any better than that, so I, I don't think I will. Great. I think, and, and from the National Health Council perspective, I think it's been very similar. We, we don't get involved on a disease-specific issue because we are an umbrella organization, and so we don't get involved in the specific um, reports that an ISO or an ASCO or an NCCN is coming out with. We do um, reply to them, you know, in terms of general concepts, as, as Paul was talking about before, and Annie, uh, respond to their request for comments or when they put out a document on their processes, and we do respond from the, on the methods and the, from, the, from the more generic. Um, and, and again, um, when we've been doing that, we do that independently, as Annie described. I will say that the one thing that we have um, been what we acknowledge is that for a program like this, we do have sponsorship from the pharmaceutical companies who help us to put, put educational materials out, um, but that's always you know, within our standards and at arm's length um, uh, process that we use. And so we do have those kinds of things in place. And, and uh, they, I think it's very similar to what Annie and Paul were, was describing. Are there any additional questions that we have from the group? Well, without any additional questions, I'm going to close the program and ask you to all please join us on Wednesday, October 25th from 3 to 4 p.m. Um, at Eastern Time and 12 to 1 Pacific Time. And um, for those of you uh, who have been enrolled in this program, you will be getting an email message from us asking you to do an evaluation of the program and to help suggest any other topics that you think that we should be covering. Thank you. Everyone have a great evening. Bye.